Hello and welcome back to Classic Movies of Star and Lil. And tonight, today we're going to get back to To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. But first, I would like to remind you to please hit the subscribe button, notification, like, and comment below. And without further ado, we are on Chapter 5. And then we're... I mean, excuse me, it's Chapter 6. And then we're going to summarize Chapters 1 through 6. Yes, said our father when Jem asked him if we could get go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fish pool with Dill, as this was his last night in Maycomb. Tell him so long for me, and we'll see him next summer. We leaped over the low wall that separated Miss Ra Rachel's yard from our driveway. Jem whistled Bob White, and Dill answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jem. Look, look a yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Maudie's pecan trees that m makes it seem... Hotter, he said. Cross it in tonight, asked Dill, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from newspaper and string. No, just the lady. Don't light that thing, Dill. You'll stink up this whole end of town. There was a lady in the moon in Maycomb. She sat at the dresser combing her hair. We're well, going to miss you, boy, I said. Reckon we better watch for Miss Avery. Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery boarded across the street from Mrs. Henry. Lafayette Dubosi's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until noon and sneezed. One evening, we were privileged to witness a performance by him which seemed to have been his positively last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jem and I were leaving Miss Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stepped, stopped us. Golly, look yonder, he pointed across the street. At first we saw nothing but a kudzu covered from porch, front porch, but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and splashing in the yellow circle of the street light, some ten feet from source to earth. It seemed for us Jem and Mr. Avery misfigured. Dill said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuing contest to determine, to determine relative distances and, and respective prowess only make me feel left out again, as I was untalented in this area. Dill stretched yawned and, sa and said together, said altogether too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody would make him just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his head in a southerly distinction, direction. Excuse me. Jem said, okay. When I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come along, Angel May. You don't have to go, remember. Jem was not one to dwell on past defeats, it seemed the only message he got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scout, we ain't gonna do anything. We're just gonna go into the street light and back. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to porch swings creating with the, creaking with the weight of the neighborhood, listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally, we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jim, why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you going to do? Dill and Jim were sim simply going to peep in the window with a loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Boo Radley. And if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the S Sam Holy Hill did you want wait till tonight? Let's see, check that out. Um, because nobody could see them at night because Atticus would... Be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming because if Rad Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime. Did I understand? Jem, please. Scout, I'm telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord you're getting more like a girl every day. With that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under the wire, high wire, fence at the rear of the Radley lot. We stood less chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden, a narrow wooden outhouse. Jem held up the bottom wire and mentioned Dill, motioned Dill under it. I followed, and I and held up the wire for Jem. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a row of colliers, whatever you do. They'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. I moved faster when I saw Jem far ahead, beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the, gar the garden from the backyard. Jem touched it. The gate squeaked. 
Spit on it, whispered Dill. Oh, spit on it, actually, whispered Dill. You've got us in a box, Jem, I muttered. We've, we can't get out of here so easy. Shh, spit on it, Scout. We spat ourselves dry, and Jem opened the gate, slowly lifting it aside and resting on it on the fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Bradley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors instead of a column. A rough two-by-four supported one end of the hall of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in a corner of the porch. Above it, a hat-rack mirror caught the moon and shone airily. Ah, said Jem softly, lifting his foot. Smatter. Chicken. Okay, smatter. Chickens, he breathed. That we would be obliged to dodge the unseen from all directions was confirmed when Dell, ahead of us, spelled God in a whisper. We crept to the side of the house around to the window with a laughing shudder. Sill was several inches taller than Jem. Give you a hand up, he muttered to Dill. Wait through. Jem grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist. I grabbed my left wrist and Jem's right wrist. We crouched and Dill sat on our saddle. We raised him and he caught the window sill. Hurry, Jem whispered. We can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder and we lowered him to the ground. What'd you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a little teeny lightweight off somewhere, though. Let's get away from here, breathed Jem. Let's go round and back again, Shh, he warned me as I was about to protest. Let's try to the back window. Dill, no, I said. Dill stopped and let Jem, Jem go ahead. When Jem put his foot on the bottom step, the step squeaked. He stood still, then tried his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jem skipped two steps, put his foot on the porch, heaved himself to it, and teetered a long moment. He, re he regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head, and looked in. Then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. First I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing, and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight, and sh the shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch toward Jem. Dill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jem, Jem saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. The shadow stopped about a foot about beyond Jem. His arm came out from its side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned to move back across Jem, walked along the porch and off the side of the house, returning as it had come. Jem leapt off the porch and galloped toward us. He flung open the gate, danced Dill and me through, and shoot us between the two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the college, I tripped. As I tripped the roar of a shotgun, shattered the neighborhood. Dill and Jem dived beside me. Jem's breath came in, saw us, fenced by the schoolyard. Hurry, scout. Jem held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through. And we're halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard's solitary oak when we sensed that Jem was not with us. We ran back and found him struggling the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave to numbness, but Jem's mind was racing. we got to get home. They'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to deer's pasture behind our house, climbed our back fence, and were at the back steps before Jem would let us pause to rest. Respiration normal, the three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, said Jem. They'll think it's funny if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Radley was standing beside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Marty, Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come. We eased in beside Miss Marty, who looked around. Where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? What happened? asked Jim. Mr. Radley shot at the Negro in his collared patch. Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared and pale, though. Says if anybody sees a wh white Negro around, that's the one. Says he got the other barrel waiting for the next sound. He hears in that patch, and next time he won't aim high, be it dog, Negro, or Jim Finch. Ma'am, asked Jem. Atticus spoke. Where's your pants, son? Pants, sir? Pants. It was no use. In his shorts before God and everybody outside. Ah, Mr. Finch. The glare from the streetlight. I could see Dill 
hatching one, his eyes widening, his face cherub face grew rounder. What is it, Dill? asked Atticus. Ah, uh, I won em from him, he said vaguely. Won them? How? Dill's hand sought the back of his head. He brought it forward and crossed his forehead. We were playing strip poker up yonder by the fish pool, he said. Gem and I relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Do Jesus, Dill Harris, gambling by my fishbowl. I'll strip poker you, sir. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel, he said. I've never heard of him doing that before. Were you all playing cards? Jim fielded Dill's eyes with his eyes sh shut. No, sir, just with matches. I admired my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Jem Scout said, Scout said, Atticus, I don't want to hear poker in any form again. Go by Dills and get your pants, Jem. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry, Jem said. Dill said, Jem, as we trotted up the sidewalk, she ain't gonna get you. He'll talk her out of it. That was fast talking, son. Listen, you hear? We stopped and heard Atticus's voice. Not serious. They all go through it, Miss Rachel. Dill was com comforted, but Jem and I weren't. There was the problem of Jem showing up some some pants in the morning. They give you some of mine, said Dill, as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jem said he couldn't get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye, and Dill went inside the house. He evidently remembered he was engaged to me, f for he ran back and kissed me swiftly in front of Jem. Y'all right here, he bawled after us. Head. Jem's pants been safely on him. We would not have slept much anyway. Every night I heard from my cot on the back porch was magnified threefold. Every scratch of feet in the gravel was Boo Radley seeking revenge. Every passing negro laughing in the night was Boo Radley loosened after us. Insects splashing against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wire to pieces. The chinaberry trees were malignant, hovering alive. I lingered between sleep and wakefulness until I heard Jem murmur. Sleep, little three eyes. Are you crazy? Shh, Atticus lights out. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jem swing his feet to the floor. I'm going after him, he said. I sat up. You can't. I won't let you. He was struggling into his shirt. I've got to. You do, and I'll wake up Atticus. You do, and I'll kill you. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. Tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's going to find him in this morning, Jem. He knows you lost him. When he shows him to Atticus... It'll be pretty bad. That's all there is to it. Go on back to bed. That's what I know, said Jem. That's why I'm going after him. He began to feel sick, going back to that place by himself. I remembered, remembered Miss Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard, be it Negro dog. Jem knew that better than I. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it. Jem, a lickin' hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off, Jem, please. He blew out his breath patiently. I, it's like this, Scout, he muttered. Atticus ain't ever whipped me since I can remember. I want to keep it that way. This was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threat, threatened us every day. You mean he never caught you at anything? Maybe so, but I just want to keep it that way, Scout. We shouldn't have done that tonight, Scout. It was then, I suppose, that Jem and I first began to part company. Sometimes I did not understand him, but... My periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded. Can't you just think about it for a minute? Bit by yourself on that place? Shut up. It's not like he'd never speak to you again or something. I'm going to wake him up, Jem. I swear I am. Jem grabbed my pajama collar and wrenched it again. And I'm going with you, I choked. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The morning, the moon was setting, and the Latisse work shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jem's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down by my sides. He went the back way through deer pasture across the schoolyard and around to the fence. I thought at least that was the way he was headed. It would take longer, so it was no not time to worry yet. I waited until it was time to worry and listened for Mr. Radley's shotgun. Then I thought I heard the back fence again, back fence squeak. It was wishful thinking. Then I heard Atticus's cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we 
made a midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom, we would find him reading. He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on, straining my eyes to see if see it flood the hall. It stayed off, and I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired. The ripe china berries drummed on the roof. When the wind when the wind stirred and the darkness was desolate, with the barking of distant dogs, there he was, recurring to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. Wordlessly, he held, his, held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. Soon he was still. I did not hear him stir again. It's the end of chapter 6, and we are going to get to the summaries of chapters 1 through 6. The chapter opens with the introduction of the narrator scout, Jean Louise Finch, her older brother Jem, Jeremy, and their friend and neighbor, Dill Charles Baker Harris. Next, Lee, Lee provides an overview of Finch family history. The ancestor, a Methodist named Simon Finch, fled British persecution and eventually settled in Alabama, where he trapped animals for fur and practiced medicine. Having bought Several slaves, he established a largely self-sufficient homestead and farm, Finch's Landing, near St. Stephen's. The family lost its wealth in the Civil War. Scout's father, Atticus Finch, studied law in Montgomery while supporting his brother, John Jack L. Finch, who was in medical school in Boston. Their sister, Alexandra, remained at Finch's Landing. Atticus began his law practice in Maycomb, the county seat of Maycomb County, where his office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, and checkerboard, an unsullied coat of Alabama. His first case entailed defending two men who refused to plead guilty for second-degree murder. They instead pled not guilty for first-degree murder and were hanged, marking probably the beginning of my, my father's prof profound distaste for criminal law. Scout then describes Depression-era Maycomb, an old tired town when I first knew it. Summer had heat and slow place, pace of life, she notes. There was no hurry, for, the, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy and no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. Scout describes as her father was entire, as entirely satisfactory. And her family's black cook, Calpurnia, as strict and tyrannical. Scout and Jem's mother died of a heart attack when Scout was two and has no memories for her. However, Jem can remember her mother, his mother, and Scout notices that he is occasionally nostalgic about her. The novel takes begins during the summer. Scout is almost six, and Jem is almost ten. Once this background picture is complete, the real narrative begins with the first meeting of Scout, Jem, and Dill, a feisty imaginative boy who is nearly seven but very small for his age. Dill defends his height, saying, I'm little, but I'm old. From Meridian, Mississippi, Dill will be spending the summer at the nearby house of Miss Rachel Haverford, his aunt. He impresses the Finch children with his dramatic recounting of the movie Dracula, which wins him their respect and friendship. The three engage in summertime play activities of... Hold on. Sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. Let me go. He impresses the Finch children with his dramatic recounting of the movie Dracula, which wins him their respect and friendship. The three engage in summertime place, play activities of improving the Finch Tree, and acting out the plots of several of their favorite books. Scout noted, notes that Dill proves to be a pocket Merlin, whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. By late summer, having exhausted these pursuits, the children turn their thoughts to the mysterious Radley place down the block from the Finch house. The Radley house is said to contain a malevolent phantom by the name of Boo Radley. Though the children have, been, have se never seen him, rumors are about that he is over six feet tall, has rotten yellow teeth, popping eyes, and drool, and eats raw animals. Whenever strange things happen in the neighborhood, Boo is often blamed. Boo's story is an extension of the strange Fat Radley family who have always disregarded local custom by keeping to themselves. Prior to his death, Mr. Bo Radley, Boo's father, had only been seen on his daily trip to collect groceries from 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m., and the family worshipped together in their own home on Sundays. Their youngest son, Arthur, who the children call Boo, apparently mixed with the wrong crowd, a gang of boys who were finally arrested and brought to court after driving an old cart through the town square. 
and locking Makem's beetle in an outhouse. Though the other boys were sent to industrial school for punishment, ironically received excellent educations. Arthur Radley's family preferred to keep him hidden inside the home. After 15 years living at home, the 33-year-old Boo is rumored to have stabbed his father in the leg with a pair of scissors and then quietly continued about his business of cutting out newspaper articles. Refusing to permit his son to be deemed insane or charged with criminal behavior, Mr. Radley allowed Boo to be locked up in the courthouse basement. The sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside Negroes. Boo was eventually brought back to the Radley home after Mr. Radley's death, his older brother Nathan arrived to continue to watch over Boo and keep him inside and out of out of sight. Dill develops an insatiable curiosity about Boo and wants to lay eyes on the strange phantom who is said to walk about at night looking in windows. Dill dares Jem to go inside the boundary of the Radley's front yard at Radley's front gate. After three days of hedging, Jem's fear of Boo succumbs to his sense of honor when Dill revives is his terms. Daring Jem to only touch the house, Jem finally agrees to do this. He runs, touches the house, and the three scramble back to the Finch's porch. We're looking down the street to the Radley house. We thought we saw an side of a shutter move flick, and the house was still. Chapter 2. The summer is over, and, and September has arrived. Dill has returned to his family in Meridian, and Scout eagerly awaits her first day of school. She is excited about the prospect of finally starting school, but her first day of first grade leaves her extremely disappointed. Her teacher, Miss Carolyn Fisher, is 21 years old and new to the Macomb County schools. Miss Carolyn is from the richer and more cultured North Alabama and does not understand the county ways of Macomb. To begin the day, Miss Carolyn reads a sat saccharine children's story about cats, which leaves the children feeling restless. Scout explains Miss Carolyn seemed unaware that the ragged denim shirt and flower sex skirt of first graders were immune to imaginative literature. Half these children had failed first grade the first year, the, the year before. Therefore, when Miss Carolyn writes the alphabet on the board and Scout reads it through easily, then reads from the, her reader and from the local paper, Miss Carolyn forbids Scout to let Atticus teach her to read anymore. <laughs> Rather than congratulating Scout on her knowledge, Miss Carolyn believes Scout is being taught incorrectly and tells her not to read at home anymore. Scout explains she doesn't remember learning how to read, but it seems she already always knew how. Miss Carolyn forbids her to continue reading. She realizes how important it is to her. It is to her. Until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. At recess, Jem listens to Scout's complaints and tries to reassure her. Explain that Miss Carolyn is introducing a new teaching system, teaching technique, which she calls the Dewey Decimal System. Back in class, Scout gets bored and starts writing a letter to Dill, who is criticized again by her teacher for knowing how to write in script, which she's only supposed to print in first grade. Scout blames Calpurnia for teaching her how to write in script on rainy days. On lunchtime, Miss Cal Carolyn asks everyone who isn't going home for lunch to show her their lunch pails. One boy, Walter Cunningham, has no pail and refuses to accept Miss Carolyn's loan of a quarter to buy something with Miss Carolyn to, to buy something with. Miss Carolyn doesn't understand his refusal, and a classmate asks Scout to help explain. Scout tells Miss Carolyn and that Walter is a Cunningham and thinks that explanation should be enough. After realizing Miss Cal Carolyn doesn't know what that means, Scout explains that the Cunninghams don't accept other people's money and just try to get by with what they, little they have proud people. Scout mentally recollects how Mr. Cunningham, when entailed, repaid Atticus for his legal services by giving the Finch family hickory nuts, stove wood, and other farm produce. The Cunninghams are farmers who don't have actual money now that the Depression is on. Many professionals in the town charge their county clients in farm produce rather than monetary currency. When Scout explains that Walter can't pay back the lunch money, Miss Carolyn offered, the teacher taps Scout's hand with a ruler and makes her stand in the corner of the room. Scout and the children are puzzled by this very unthreatening form of whipping. The entire class laughs until a locally born sixth grader grade teacher arrives and announces that she'll burn up everybody in the room if they aren't quiet. The first half of the day ends and on her way out of the classroom, Scout sees Miss Carolyn bury her head in her arms as the children leave the room. However, Scout doesn't feel sorry for her considering her unfriendly treatment that morning. Chapter 3. 
Jem invites Walter Cunningham over for lunch when he finds out that the boy doesn't have any food. Walter hesitates, but then takes Jem up on the friendly offer. At the Finch house, Atticus and Walter discuss farming, and Scout is overwhelmed by their adult speech. Walter asks for some molasses and proceeds to pour it all over his meat and vegetables. Scout rudely asks him what he's doing, and Capernaum gives her a lecture in the kitchen about how to treat guests, even if they are from a family like the Cunninghams. Back at school, there's a big scene when Miss Carolyn screams up upon seeing a, l a louse, a loose, louse, a cootie, crawl out the head of one of the boys in the class. Oof. This boy, Burris Ewell, comes from a family so poor that Atticus says they live like animals. Their children come to school on the first day of the year and then are never seen again. Children inform their teacher of this, explaining that he's one of the Ewells. Miss Carolyn wants Burris to go home and take a bath, but before he leaves the room for the rest of the year, he yells crude insults at her and makes her cry. Children comfort her and she reads them a story. Scout feels discouraged returning home from school. After dinner, she tells Atticus she doesn't want to go back. Atticus asks her to understand the situation from Miss Carolyn's point of view. Miss Carolyn can't be expected to know what to do with her students when she doesn't know anything about them yet. Scout wants to be like Burr's Ewell and not have to go to school at all. As Atticus explains, the town authorities bend the law for the Ewells because they'll never change their ways. For instance, Mr. Ewell can hunt out of season because he knows he spends his relief checks on whiskey and his children won't eat if he doesn't hunt. Atticus teaches Scout about compromise. If she goes to school, Atticus will let her keep reading with him at home. Scout agrees, and Atticus reads to her and Jem from the papers. Chapter 4 School continues. The year goes by. Scout doubts that the new educational system is really doing her any good. She found school boring and wishes the teacher would allow her to read and write, rather than ask the children to do silly activities geared towards group dynamics and good citizenship. One afternoon, as she runs past the Radley house, she notices something in the knothole of one of the oak trees in the front yard. She investigates further and finds two pieces of chewing gum. Scout is careful, but eventually decides to chew them. Upon learning she is chewing found gum, Jem makes her spit it out. Later, towards the end of the school year, Jem and Scout find two pol polished Indian head pennies, good luck tokens, inside the same knothole. The children don't know if the knothole is someone's hiding place or if the pennies are a gift. Decide to take them and keep them safely at the bottom of Jem's truck. trunk. Dill comes to make him for the summer again, full of stories about train rides and his father, whom he claims to have finally seen. The three try to start a few games, but quickly get bored. Jem rolls Scout inside an old tire, but he pushes so hard that it ends Radley yard. Terrified, Scout runs back home, but leaves the tire behind. Jem has to run to the yard and retrieve the tire. Dill thinks Boo Radley died, and Jem says they suffered stuffed his body up the chimney. Scout thinks maybe he's still alive. They invent a new game about Boo Radley. Jem plays Boo. Dill plays Mr. Radley. Scout plays Mrs. Radley. They polish it up over the summer into a little dramatic reenactment of the gossip, of all the gossip they've heard about Boo and his family, including the scene using Calpurnia's scissors as a prop. One day, Atticus catches them playing the game and asks them if it has anything to do with the Radley family. They deny it, and Atticus replies, I hope it doesn't. Atticus' sternness forces them to stop playing as Scout is relieved because she's worried for another reason. She thought she heard the sound of someone laughing inside the Radley house when her tire rolled into their yard. Chapter 5 Jem and Dill have become closer friends, and Scout, being a girl, finds herself often excluded from their play. Dill, in childish fashion, has decided to get engaged to Scout, but now he and Jem play together often, Scout finds herself unwelcome. Instead of playing with the boys, Scout often sits with their neighbor, the avid gardener, Miss Maudie Atkinson. Watches the sun set on her front yard, or partakes of Miss Maudie's fine homemade cake. Miss Maudie's honest in her speech and, and her ways, with a witty tongue, and Scout considers her a trusted friend. Scout asks her one day about Boo Radley, and Miss Maudie says that he's still alive, he just doesn't like to come outside. She also says that most of the rumors about him aren't true. Miss Marty explains that the Radleys are foot-washing Baptists. They believe all pleasure is a sin against God. That means must must be one cruel God, huh? Puts us on here to be miserable. And stay inside most of the time reading the Bible. She says that Arthur was a nice boy when he, she used to know him. The next day, Jem and Dill hatch a plan to leave a note for Boo in the Radleys' window using a fishing line. The note will ask him to come out sometimes and tell them what, what he's doing inside. And that he won't, they won't hurt him, and will buy him ice cream. 
Dill says he wants Boo to come out and sit with them for a while, as it might make the man feel better. Dill and Scout keep watch in case anyone comes along, and Jem tries to deliver the note with the fishing pole, finds that it's harder to maneuver than he expected. As he struggles, Atticus arrives and catches them all. He tells them to stop tormenting Boo and lectures them about how Boo has a right to his privacy and that he, sh he shouldn't go near the house unless they are invited. Accuses them of putting Boo's life history on display for the edification of the neighborhood. That again, okay. Jem says he didn't say they were doing that and thus inadvertently admits that they were doing just that. Atticus caught him with the oldest lawyer's trick on record. Chapter 6 is Dill's last summer night in Maycomb. Jem and Scout get permission to go sit with him that evening. Dill wants to go for a walk, but it turns into something more. Dill and Jem, Jem and Dill want to sneak over to the Radley place and peek into one of the, the windows. Scout doesn't want them to do it, but Jem accuses her of being girlish, an insult she can't bear. She goes along with it. They sneak under a wire fence and go through a gate. At the window. Scout and Jem hoist Dill up to peek in the window. Dill says sees nothing, only curtains and a small faraway light. The boys want to try a back window. Instead, despite Scout's pleas to leave, as Jim is raising his head to look in, the shadow of a man appears and crosses over him. As soon as it's gone, the three children run as fast as they can, can back home, but Jem loses his pants in the gate. As they run, they sh hear a shotgun around, sound somewhere behind them. When they return, Mr. Radley is standing beside his gate, and Atticus is there with the various neighbors. He heard that Mr. Radley was shooting at a white negro in his backyard and has another barrel waiting if he returns. Dale makes up a story about playing his strip poker to explain Jem's missing pants, and Jem says they were playing with matches rather than cards, which would be consider considered unforgivable. Dale says goodbye to them, and Jem and Scout go to bed. Jem decides to go back and get his pants late that night. Scout tries to persuade him that it would be better to get whipped by Atticus than be shot and killed by Mr. Radley. But Jem insists on going. Jem explains that he's never been whipped by Atticus and doesn't want to be. Jem is gone for a little while but returns with the pants trembling. The Analysis The first chapter's emphasis on family history and stories within stories describes the rigid social ties that hold society together in the little town of Macomb, Alabama, and the inescapable links that tie an individual to his or her family clan. The book opens by mentioning how, at age 12, Jem broke his arm. The narrator notes that the remainder of the book will explain how this injury occurred, and the novel concluded with this event. From the outset, through historical analysis, the novel tries to conclude how this particular situation arose. The children's attempt to trace the main incident in the novel, Jem's broken arm, back to its roots, leads them to wonder whether it all began when Dill Del first arrived in Macomb came their friend of whether the real origins lie deeper in their ancestral history and the chance events that brought the Finch family to make home. The debate speaks to deeper fundamental issues on the nature of human good and evil. and the old nature versus nurture debate, Dill, the new kid in town, represents an outside influence upon the children that affects them deeply, whereas the family history scout recounts is a more inexplorable explorable pattern which existed long before the children were born. Atticus tells Jem and Scout that patterns of history, family identity, temperament, both new and old, may help make an individual. Scout narrates the book in the first person, but in the past tense. Her voice and viewpoint offer a glimpse of local events and personalities through the lens of childhood, which may not always grasp the entire story. She often looks up to Atticus, who is always, always displays an upright, solidly moral response for his reactions to events. However, Scout's voice often assumes a mature tone when she writes from a more distant time, speaking of the town and its people in the far-off past tense, and offering explanations for outdated terms. Mr. Radley's bought cotton, a plate term for doing nothing. This narrative device allows the reader to understand more about some of the events that Scout recounts than the, narrator, than the young narrator is completely aware of. The Radley house is old, dark, closed off, and uncivilized in contrast to the rest of the neighborhood. Once white, it is now a gr slate gray color with rotten shingles, little sunlight, overgrown yards, and a closed door on Sundays. The Radleys are also differentiated from the community by their willful isolation from the useful patterns of social interaction which causes the town to 
ostracize them and unreasonably turn the mysterious boo into a scapegoat for any odd and, misfortune and unfortunate circumstances that occur. For instance, when various domesticated animals are mutilated and killed, townspeople still suspect Boo even after Crazy Addy is found guilty of this violence. This foreshadows the town's treatment of Tom Robinson later in the book. They will find him guilty despite rational evidence to the contrary. Scout describes that Radley's tendency to keep to themselves, a predilection, election unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Her choice of the word rec recreation to describe church worship it hints towards the town people's ethical hypocrisy, especially in its close conjuncture, conjunction with the idea of forgiveness, a major Christian virtue. Going to church may not guarantee that people will uphold the virtues of Christianity when worship is reduced to a social event and the laws of society have, been, have more bearing upon what is forgivable than the laws of the church. This idea is fleshed out in more detail in chapter 24, in which women from Maycomb's missionary society display equal doses of religious morality and outright racist bigotry. For the children, Boo is only what they have heard from popular legend and interpreted in their own imaginations. Scout's retelling of Jem's descriptions of Boo show how her young mind could not yet distinguish between fact and fiction. Jem explains that Boo dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were bloodstained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. The children's acceptance of such superstitions as the permanence of raw animal blood shows that they're equally susceptible to accepting the local gossip about the mysterious Boo as evidenced by Scout's evaluation of Jem's description as reasonable. The, children's pers the childish perspective however easily misled, is also shown in this chapter to probe closer to a truth than the adults are capable of. Dill's comment, I'm little but I'm old, explains why his height seems disproportionate to his maturity, but also symbolically suggests that little people may have a wiser grasp on, on, on events than their elders. The physical representation of this facet of childhood is represented in Jem's daring rush in of Radley's hot yard, in which he enters a space that has been fundamentally condemned by the entire town. The journey of this one individual against the more, mores of the entire group, though, performed here in fear and on a dare, symbolically speaks towards events that will follow when Atticus defends Tom Robinson in court and Scout breaks up the threatening mob of townspeople. Dill tries to persuade the other two to make him boo come out because I'd like to see what he looks like. His desire for this seeing has symbolic relevance to the idea that children who are as yet still somewhat innocent and influenced by their society have a desire to see things more truly than adults and can be capable of understanding the fallacies of adult biases, prejudices, and false accusations. In Chapter 2, the description of Scout's first day allows Lee to provide a context for the events, followed by introducing some of the people and families of Maycomb County. By introducing Miss Carolyn, who is like a foreigner in the school, Lee also reveals Maycomb culture to the reader. Maycomb County children are portrayed as mainly poor, uneducated, rough, rural group. Most of them had chopped cotton, fed hogs from the time they were able to walk. In contrast to Miss Carolyn, who wears makeup and looked smelled like a pe peppermint drop. The chapter helps show that a certain amount of ignorance prevails in Maycomb County, but also somewhat, excuse me, the school system, as represented by Miss Carolyn, is well-intentioned, and not, but also somewhat powerless to make a dent in patterns of behavior which are deeply ingrained in the town's social fabric. <clears throat> as seen in the first chapter, where a person's identity is greatly influenced by their family and its history, this family again shows that in Maycomb, a child's behavior can be explained simply by his family's last name. It's when Scout explains to her teacher he's a Cunningham. Atticus says that Mr. Cunningham came from a set breed of men, which suggests that the entire Cunningham line shares the same values. In this case, they have pride. They do not like to take money they can't pay back. They continue to live off the land in poverty rather than work for the government in the WPA FDR's Work Projects Administration. Thus, in Maycomb County, people belong to familial breeds, which can determine a member's disposition or temperament. All the other children in the class understand this. Growing up in this setting teaches children that people can behave a certain way 
simply because of their family or group that they come from. The chapter also establishes that Scout is a very intelligent and precocious child who learned how to read through her natural instinct, sitting on Atticus's lap and following along in his book. She doesn't understand that she loves to read until her teacher tells her she can't read anymore. This shows that reading was a pleasure and a freedom she has taken for granted all her life until it is denied to her. The value of some freedoms can't be fully understood until a person is forced to be depart from them. Similarly, Scout and Jem will learn the full importance of justice later in the book through the trial of Tom Robinson, where justice is withheld and die, denied to a black man. The implication is that young people intrinsically expect certain human freedoms and have a natural sense for freedom and justice, which they only become aware of when the adults in society begin trying to take such freedoms away. I mean, I was a naive little kid. I believed that way. And I mean, everything's changed. I just, it's been unbelievable. Though Scout is young and impressionable, she became a, becomes a spokesperson for her entire class, interacting with the adult teacher. Comfortably, this shows that, though a child, she is more grown up than most of her peers, some of her peers. In this chapter, Lee also reveals how Scout looks at Jem for support and wisdom. Jem is sometimes wrong in his advice. He thinks that entailment is having your tail in the crack, when it actually has to do with the way property is inherited. Calls a new re reading technique, the Dewey Decimal System, because he's confusing the library catalog with the new educational theories of John Dewey. However, he gives his little sister support when she needs it, even though he warned her not to tag along with him and his fifth grade friends at school. In Chapter 3, Atticus's patient teaching gives Scout a lesson that he says will help her get along better with all kinds of folks. She has to remember to judge people on their intentions rather than their actions and put herself into the other person's shoes in order to understand them best. The chapter establishes that Atticus can relate to all kinds of people, including poor farm children. The last sentence of the chapter, Atticus was right, applies not only to his pre prediction that Jem will come down from his tree house if left alone, but also to most issues of character judgment. Atticus's opinions can usually be trusted, and he is convinced of the importance of dealing fairly and reasonably with all people, no matter what the circumstances. The chapter introduces the Ewell family, who will figure heavily into the latter part of the book. Burris Ewell and his family manage to live outside the local and national laws because they are so poor and ignorant, belonging to the lowest circle of white Maycomb society. The Ewell children only need to come to school for the first day, and then the town will overlook the fact that they are absent, even though schooling is mandatory for all children. Likewise, Mr. Yule is allowed to hunt out a season because he is known to be an alcoholic who spends his relief money on whiskey. If he can't hunt it, his children might, may not eat. Here we see how the law, which is meant to protect people, can sometimes be harmful if followed too absolutely. Kind of like people that think that uh, this should be drug testing, EBT. And then, then the children go hungry. Yeah, they don't have the food because their parents are on drugs. So you're punishing the kids. So, okay, the town's opinion is that no law will ever force the Ewells to change because they are set in their ways. Rather than the law must change to accommodate them and protect the children should not have to suffer needlessly. Scout also learns that the reason Walter Cunningham doesn't pass first grade is because he has to leave school in the, in the spring to help around the farm. The Cunninghams are not all necessarily illiterate and ignorant because of lack of intelligence, but because they are subject to a system which subverts their chances of receiving a good education. Cunninghams must keep the farm running in order to survive, and because the school system does not make any accommodations for farm children, there's a self-perpetuating societal cycle for farm families to remain uneducated and ignorant. Chapter 4, we see that the schools have attempted to teach children how to behave in groups and how to be upstanding citizens, but Scout notes that her father and Jem learn these traits without the kind of schooling she is getting. The school may be attempting to turn the children into moral beings, but Scout's moral education occurs almost exclusively in her home or in the presence of Maycomb adults and friends. This suggests that schools can only provide limited change in children's moral sensibility or no change at all. Families and communities are the true sculptors of children's sense of what is right and wrong and good and what is not. 
Except in gifts in the Radley tree knot hole and rolling accidentally into the Radley yard are some of the first signs that the children are slowly coming closer to making contact with Boo. They're still terrified, however, by the mystery of Boo. Their curiosity in the drama game they create shows how desperately they wanted to find answers to their questions about Boo in the absence of any real information or knowledge. Likewise, the townspeople have a tendency to react unfavorably to things that are different until they have reasons to understand the difference. In addition, the children are gradually humanizing Boo. He was referred to in the opening chapter as a malevolent phantom, but by now he's a real man whose antisocial behavior marks him as unusual and therefore suspicious or danger, dangerous. In chapter 5, though, Atticus tries to encourage the children to leave Boo alone. The senses of sympathy have been summoned by th thinking about Boo's solitude and his strict upbringing. Though still frightened of him, they wish to befriend him and help him now. Miss Marty's description of Boo helps the children understand him as a victim of his upbringing. Miss Marty is one of the only women whom Scout respects and is friendly with Calpurnia. With Calpurnia and Miss Marty are the main motherly influences of her life. Later on, while Aunt Alexandra imposes herself as a maternal substitute, trying to turn Scout into a lady against her will, Miss Marty is the most unbiased and supportive of these three women. Though Calpurnia becomes... On. Much more sympathetic as time goes by, Miss Marty is obsessed with her flower beds and goes about tending them despite disapproval of the foot washing Baptists, occasionally accused of her of spending too much time in such vain and earthly pursuits. Miss Marty is opposed to these staunch, strict ideals, but is also religious, showing that perhaps she finds her.